Okay, it's been uh, over a week since we featured Elon Musk in a thumbnail, so uh, we can actually just go ahead with all the dumb Elon news right here at the top of today's show without yeah. having to sneak it in a little it later It was on. nice uh, taking the, the spotlight for a little bit, having ourselves in the thumbnail for at least one episode. I can see why Philly D does it all the time. Very uh, uplifting. Yeah. Looking at myself like that, all it's, happy. It's good to be in your own thumbnail. Uh-huh. And I know at least a few of you wish that we'd stop talking about this Elon guy. But Sorry. But it's important to remember that in addition to Elon Musk being the world's richest person and one of the most famous people on Earth and a constant source of cringe and frustration, um, he's also extremely influential and powerful in ways that are easy to forget if you just focus on his online presence and all of his terrible decisions running the app formerly known as Twitter. Mm -hmm. And one man having all that power and influence is never good. I believe Kanye yeah. said something about that yeah. once. But yeah, it's especially bad when that one man is Elon Musk, of all yeah. people. Not exactly a stable genius. No. And uh, has a lot of government contracts. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of power that he probably shouldn't have, especially when he displays his mental capacity on a daily basis on Twitter.com. X.com. So, uh, no, it's the <laughs> it's the only thing you're. It's okay to dead name until they get rid of that redirect. <laughs> yeah, I'm dead naming. Uh, so that brings us to uh, a recent article in the New Yorker, written by Ronan Farrow, the guy who almost single handedly took down Harvey Weinstein. It's a long read, and most of it is stuff that you already know if you watch this show. But it's summed up uh, very well by a very talented journalist, and it also includes some new insights for someone who hasn't kept up to speed on Elon's shenanigans in recent years, i.e. A normal person. None of them here. No, <laughs> we're all brain broken. Uh, it's probably fairly alarming to take this all as a whole. So if you're just like, yeah. huh, I, I, I heard that he bought some website. Uh, I like the car. The car guy? What oh, do you mean? And, oh, let's, let's check out this article. Oh, my God. Yeah. This guy's a total idiot. It's a pretty thorough uh, just recap of all of his bullshit. For us, it provides some great passages that we're going to read from today. But first, we're just going to sum up the opening section of this article because it really underlines the idea that maybe this Elon guy is a little bit too powerful. So yeah, you'll recall that when Russia invaded Ukraine back in early 2022, Russian attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure cut off internet access for much of the country, including the Ukrainian military. It's bad. So the solution was Starlink the satellite internet service from Musk's company SpaceX. And at least at first, Elon seemed happy to help by donating Starlink hardware and providing free access. But within a few months, he was openly threatening to revoke that access if he didn't get paid and was publicly calling for Ukraine to just concede the occupied territories and end the war. Mm. This caused a chaotic situation behind the scenes, with the U.S. Department of Defense finding themselves in a situation where the fate of Ukraine largely rested in the hands of one dude who didn't seem particularly committed and could just back out at any time. And they very delicately tried to stall him, at least, until they could come up with a deal to pay for continued Starlink access. In the meantime, though, shit like this was happening. From the article... One day, Ukrainian forces advancing into contested areas in the south found themselves suddenly unable to communicate. We were very close to the front line, Mikola, the Signal Corps soldier, told me. We crossed this border and the Starlink stopped working. The consequences were immediate. Communications became dead. Units were isolated. When you're on offense, especially for commanders, you need a constant stream of information from battalions. Commanders had to drive to the battlefield to be in radio range, risking themselves, Mikola said. It was chaos. Ukrainian expats who had raised funds for the Starlink units began receiving frantic calls. The tech executive recalls a Ukrainian military official telling him, We need Elon now. How now, he replied. Like fucking now, the official said. People are dying. Another Ukrainian involved told me that he was awoken by a dozen calls saying they'd lost connectivity and had to retreat. The Financial Times reported that outages affected units in Kherson, Zaporizhia, Kharkiv, Donetsk, and Luhansk. American and Ukrainian officials told me they believed that SpaceX had cut the connectivity via geofencing, cordoning off areas of access. Huh. So basically, Elon Musk, after publicly calling for Ukraine to give up its contested territories, seems to have geofenced Ukraine's Starlink access so that it wouldn't work if they got too close to those contested territories, mm -hmm. which, of course, would happen at some point. Yeah. Because despite what Elon thinks, they want that shit back. So, uh, and and they figured, they found this out as it was happening. So, yeah, always oh, the I, best time oh, to find cool, out. Oh, cool, and it didn't work. And uh, they said people are dying, so um, 
I mean, probably not. It, definitely not the first person Elon Musk has indirectly killed. We have years of Teslas yeah, crashing. True. But uh, add that to the body count, mm-hmm. I guess. Uh, the article goes on to quote a Pentagon official who says that while negotiating a Starlink deal, Musk admitted that he had recently spoken personally with Russian President Vladimir Putin. And another source says Musk had been talking with the Kremlin on a regular basis around this time. Uh, Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI and former colleague of Musk, is quoted saying, Elon desperately wants the world to be saved, but only if he can be the one to save it. Uh... Not good. Uh, And yeah, that same attitude is displayed later in the article when discussing SpaceX and Tesla's disregard for government regulation. Uh, But first, let's look at some of the funnier parts of this, because that last part was a little dark. Let's let's lighten up, like uh, with this section about how Elon Musk's media literacy is um, garbage. But then again, most of the people alive today, that's (laughs) also true. He said that his hero is Douglas Adams, the writer who skewered both the hyper-rich and the progress-at-any-cost ethos that Musk has come to embody. In the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy novels and radio plays, the latter of which were broadcast in South Africa during Musk's childhood, a narcissistic playboy becomes the president of the galaxy, and Earth is demolished to make way for a space transit route. Musk is also an avowed fan of Deus Ex, a role-playing first-person shooter video game that he has brought up when discussing his company Neuralink, which aspires to invent ability-enhancing body modifications like those featured in the game. During the pandemic, Musk seemed to embrace COVID denialism, and for a while, he changed his Twitter profile picture to an image of the protagonist of the game, which turns on a manufactured plague designed to control the masses. But Deus Ex, like The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, is a fundamentally anti-capitalist text in which the plague is the culmination of unrestrained corporate power and the villain is the world's richest man, a media-darling tech entrepreneur with global aspirations and political leaders under his control. Sounds like a pretty cool guy. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Just, you know, taking exactly the parts that you want out of every story and ignoring the rest. Or not even ignoring it, just being completely ignorant to but, what's going on, I mean, to what's as, actually happening. As we've seen in recent years, this is this is just a common phenomenon. People don't know how to consume media. Um, half the conservatives in this country think that uh, Homelander on The Boys is really based. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> Elon Musk is consuming science fiction the same way that evangelicals consume the Bible. Just like, I like this part. Yeah. I love this part. This mm-hmm. other stuff, uh, not for me. Makes me feel a little bit guilty about literally everything I do in my day-to-day life uh, and how I treat people. I think you're but, giving them too much credit. <laughs> this other part, didn't read it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, you're, you're right, you're right, yeah. Nah. <laughs> uh, and here's a section on, this is a story that's been around for a long time. Mm-hmm. Elon has told it himself over and over, but I don't think we've ever actually covered it, which sucks, because it is hilarious, so we're going to well, talk no, about it We've been it saving it for this exact episode. Uh-huh. It's You know, we can't just give you guys all this stuff. It's uh, an incredible story that if this was me, you'd have to waterboard this information out of me, <laughs> but uh, Elon uses it as a way to talk about himself. Yeah. Uh, but here you go. Perhaps the most revealing moment in the PayPal saga happened at its outset. In March 2000, as the merger was underway, Musk was driving his new McLaren with Peter Thiel in the passenger seat. The two were on Sand Hill Road, an artery that cuts through Silicon Valley. Thiel asked Musk, so what can this do? Musk replied, watch this, then floored the gas pedal, hit an embankment, and sent the car airborne and spinning before it slammed back onto the pavement, blowing out its suspension and its windows. (laughs) This isn't insured, Musk told (laughs) Thiel. (laughs) I love that's his first comment. This isn't insured. (laughs) Not insuring a million dollar car. What do you? I mean, what does he? Need? Why? Why would he need to? He's got money to burn, and he did so. it as, to prove a point. Musk's critics have used the story to illustrate his reckless showboating, but it also underscores how often Musk has been rewarded for that behavior. He repaired the McLaren, drove it for several more years, then reportedly sold it at a profit. Musk delights in telling the story, lingering on the risk to his life. In one interview, asked whether there were parallels with his approach to building companies, Musk said. I hope not. (laughs) Appearing to consider the idea, he added, watch this. Yeah, that could be awkward with a rocket launch. (laughs) But yeah, later in the piece, it describes Musk doing essentially literally that, ignoring the FAA and launching a rocket right after specifically being told not to and having the rocket unintentionally explode while attempting to land. As many were quick to point out, Elon Musk saying, watch this, right before crashing a million dollar sports car, was basically a real life version of the classic 2014 tweet from user at Mike Fossey. Check this shit out, motherfucker. 
I slide one foot out from under me and fall on my ass. It's not clear what kind of move I was trying to do. <laughs> Watch this. Check this out. I hope that that uh, McLaren uh, engine is cursed the same way the James Dean. I hope whoever bought it got the Carfax. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa! Because, <laughs> uh, I mean... I, you're I, telling me this thing's never been in an accident. Clean bill. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I mean, that car's probably a ship of Theseus at this point. Mm. Like, I... Yeah, that's... I wouldn't trust it. Yeah. Anyway, I wouldn't drive a fucking McLaren in the first place. That's a stupid use of money. Come on. Yeah. I mean, I'd drive it, but I wouldn't buy it. It, it, it is... <laughs> also, Elon just displaying... Uh, the buying too much power that you're not used to, the same way Mustang owners yeah. uh, just peel out of parking lots and uh, not only wreck their car, but the cars of innocent others. Yeah. It's just, if you're not prepared for the power that a sports car has, you're not going to be able to control it. Yeah. And and to be fair, I mean, Mustangs get, uh, they get, they get singled out for this, but that's just because Mustangs are cheap enough that your average person can get one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, Probably just uh, proportionally well, just, now it's more just as many rich people uh, ruining their stupid yeah, new cars as the well. The Mustang thing is a bit antiquated at this point because it's all Dodge Chargers and Challengers now that are doing it. Yeah. The, the Mustang is a responsible, uh, no emission electric car now. No, there's still a real Mustang. <laughs> that's, okay. not a, that's not a Mustang. Oh, yeah. that's, uh, the, the Mustang EV is pretty cool, though. I just wish they didn't call it that. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah. Yeah, Elon is clearly a reckless guy who doesn't like being told what to do because he thinks he knows better. And this has been a constant source of frustration for the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, as illustrated in the following paragraphs. In early 2022, Stephen Cliff, then the Deputy Administrator of the Department of Transportation's National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, learned that potentially tens of thousands of Tesla vehicles had a feature that he found concerning. <laughs> For years, Tesla has been working to create a totally self-driving car, a long-standing ambition of Musk's. Now, Cliff was told that a version of Tesla's full self-driving software, an experimental feature that lets the cars navigate with little intervention from a driver, permitted cars to roll through stop signs at up to about six miles an hour. This was clearly illegal. <laughs> Cliff's enforcement team contacted Tesla, and in several meetings, a surprising conversation about safety and artificial intelligence played out. Representatives for Tesla seemed confused. Their response, as Cliff recalled, was, that's what humans do all the time. Show us the data, why it's unsafe. NHTSA officials told Tesla that regardless of human compliance, you should not be able to program a computer to break the law for you. They demanded that Tesla update all the affected cars, removing the feature, a recall in industry terms, albeit a digital one. There was a lot of back and forth, Cliff told me. Like, at midnight on the very last day, they blinked and ended up recalling the rolling stop feature. Tesla did not respond to requests for comment. And you have to imagine that Elon was uh, the one just like, no. It's no, so gonna annoying. Call, we're going to call their bluff. Don't don't send out the, the recall. And then, like, at the last minute, some Tesla engineer is just like, whoops. Yeah, I don't want to deal with this yeah. anymore. <laughs> so let's just... Let's just knock it into Just a leave fight. it off of Elon's car and turn it on for everyone yeah. else. And that way he can live in a reality where the, he won. But like six miles, like, <laughs> I mean, people do, it's the California stop. We invented it here. But uh, I mean, six miles an hour, that that's not even close to stopping. That's, uh, you're, you're just, you're going through the stop sign. It's fucking insane that they're just like, yeah, well, I mean, like everyone does it. So yeah, it's, uh... and it's, uh, it's wild that, I would have hoped that at least one person got pulled over by a motorcycle cop hiding behind a tree. Yeah. And then like, well, it wasn't me, officer. It was the car, it was that, the was car that did it. Oh, well, you're under arrest then. <laughs> uh, no, it, it, with humans, I, I don't know. There's there's a bazillion different ways to take this. It's, you know, if you're driving in the middle of the night in the middle of nowhere, yeah, okay, you can roll the stop sign. Right. If it's Human, like humans two in understand, the afternoon and the school is just letting out. Humans understand <laughs> context in a way yeah. that a car <laughs> yeah. never possibly can. Yeah. But yeah, um, it continues. Musk joined Tesla as an investor in 2004, a year after it was incorporated. He has spent years defending the formative nature of his role and was eventually, in a legal settlement, one of several people granted permission to use the term co-founder. Musk was again entering a market bound by entrenched private interest and stringent regulation, which opened him up to more clashes with regulators. Some of the skirmishes were trivial. Tesla, for a time, included in its vehicles the ability to replace the humming noise that electric cars must emit since their engines make little sound, with goat bleats, farting, or a sound of the owner's choice. We're like, no, that's not compliant with the regulations. Don't be stupid, Cliff told me. 
Tesla argued with regulators for more than a year, according to an NHTSA safety report. Nine days after the rolling stop recall, the company pulled the noises too. On Twitter, Musk wrote, The fun police made us do it. Sigh. It's a little like mom and dad and children. Like, how far can I push mom and dad until they push back, Cliff said. And that's not a recipe for a strong safety culture. No, yeah, I, I, uh, I would tend to agree with that. Yeah. Uh, when we're talking about uh, cars that weigh thousands of pounds, um, I'd prefer to err on the side of safety. It is like teaching a, a child because a lot of the things, that you, with, especially with the safety compliance, it's just like these regulations were born from blood. Right. No, every, every safety feature on a car is the result of uh, something horrible that happened, you know, in what would seem like a statistically small amount of cases. Like, you're only in your entire lifetime, there's probably going to be a handful of car rides where your seatbelt really comes in clutch. <laughs> yeah. Nevertheless, we all wear seatbelts all the time because we don't know when that's going to be. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah. No, Elon's the type of guy that buys that uh, thing on Amazon yeah. to shove into the... Man, the seatbelt noise is annoying the crap out of me. Uh, a perfect example. I mean, to a... be fair, a lot of people in this country are too big to fit the... Uh... They have to get the extender. Right. <laughs> uh, a perfect example. Every year, specifically I went there this year, so I was a bit more aware of it, but every year, just look at the death statistics from Sturgis Motorcycle Rally and look at how many helmets. of those were completely preventable <laughs> if the people that died were wearing a fucking helmet. But they don't have to, and so every death nearly, like 90% of the deaths are the result of not wearing a helmet. It says it in the news articles. Well, I'd rather die looking cool than live looking like a dork. Insane. Uh, but it continues. The fart debate had low stakes. The overall safety of the cars is a far greater matter. Tesla has repeatedly said that autopilot, a more limited technology than full self-driving, is safer than a human driver. Last year, Musk added that he would be shocked if full self-driving didn't become safer than human drivers by the end of the year. <laughs> but he has never made public the data needed to fully corroborate those claims. In recent months, new crash numbers from the NHTSA, which were first reported by the Washington Post, have shown an uptick in accidents and fatalities involving autopilot and full self-driving. Tesla has been secretive about the specifics. A person at the NHTSA told me that the company instructed the agency to redact specifics about whether driver assistance software was in use during crashes. By law, regulators must abide by such requests for confidentiality unless they decide to contest them in court. What the fuck? Pete Buttigieg, the Secretary of Transportation, recently said that there were concerns about the marketing of autopilot. Cliff told me he had seen data that showed Teslas were involved in a disproportionate number of crashes involving emergency vehicles, though he said that the agency had not yet determined whether the technology or the human drivers was the cause. In a statement, a spokesperson for the agency said, multiple investigations remain open. And then that's back to the <laughs> humans understanding context in a way the cars don't. Uh, a lot of these Tesla crashes are like crashing into like fucking fire trucks and ambulances and uh, shit like that, because as a human, we are very receptive to sirens, the sounds of sirens, flashing and lights. the flashing lights and shit, and uh, the cars Much like the so much. episode of uh, Itchy and Scratchy Land, the flashes confuse the computer. <laughs> it turns them into killing machines. They predicted it. I mean, bright lights literally, like, deactivate Tesla cameras. You, you can't drive into the sun. And nothing's brighter <laughs> than the headlights on a Tesla. So it's, uh, they're really just fighting each yeah. other. Because Elon Musk very wisely took out all, like, LiDAR and radar and just... Uh, and so, we're, cameras will do the trick. Cameras. It, no, no camera has ever been foiled by just, like, shining a fucking flashlight Tr at it. Trusting the safety of you and your passengers uh, to technology that was horrific just trying to play a video game on the Kinect is something that I wouldn't find myself doing. But uh, the article touches on one, also touches on one prominent theory for why exactly Elon is like this. What is going on with this guy? Well, he's on drugs. Da, 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 da. Counterpoint, he's always kind of been like this. But yeah, if he's self-medicating with ketamine, as has been long rumored and somewhat confirmed by Musk himself, that could certainly amplify some of his qualities, especially when combined with the fact that Elon apparently spends a lot of time completely alone. A ketamine researcher is quoted saying, a little bit of ketamine has an effect similar to alcohol. It can cause disinhibition where you do and say things you otherwise would not. At higher doses, it has another effect, which is dissociation. You feel detached from your body and surroundings. 
You can feel grandiose and like you have special powers or special talents. People do impulsive things. They could do inadvisable things at work. The impact depends on the kind of work. For a librarian, there's less risk. If you're a pilot, it can cause big problems. And if you're the richest man in the world... Who, and sending uh, rockets into space... Uh, yeah, has, and, like, uh, exclusive contracts with the government... Has and, millions uh, of cars on the road... And, and you have a satellite internet service that mm -hmm. is uh, essential to Ukraine not getting wet. Trying yeah, it's, to uh, control uh, social media and speech online. And... Probably wouldn't want that person to be abusing ketamine. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds great. Anyway, yeah, it's a great article. Uh, lots more in there. Link down in the description. Yeah. And we're probably going to be getting a lot more insight like this next month, three weeks from now, when Walter Isaacson's Elon Musk biography comes out on 9-11. Wow. Another thing to remember 9-11. A second Elon Musk biography. Has Another thing to shots. remember 9-11 for, uh, alongside the Ted Cruz, Porn yeah. Rooney. They're putting it out that day so you don't forget. Yeah. Mm hmm but for now, we've got a little bit more Musk news via Matt Binder of Mashable, who has quickly become the, the top dog of keeping up with Elon's day-to-day -day bullshit, running X, the everything app. Less than a week after ex-CEO Linda Yaccarino claimed the platform formerly known as Twitter was safe for brands, at least two companies are suspending ad campaigns on the social media website. Why? Because the brand's ads appeared alongside neo-Nazi content. <laughs> Pharmaceutical giant Gilead and the NCTA, the Internet and Television Association, have both informed CNN that its company was no longer advertising on X following a new report that found major brands' ads being shown on content promoting Nazi ideology. The NCTA said in a statement to CNN that it was using X's brand safety tools, ones in which ex-CEO Yaccarino recently promoted as one of the reasons the platform was now safe for advertisers. Well, guess not. X has struggled to woo brands back to the platform following Elon Musk's acquisition of the company in October. Approximately half of the company's biggest advertisers stopped running ads on the platform following content moderation changes implemented by Musk. Furthermore, one organization that had ads placed on this content claimed that it wasn't an X advertiser at all. <laughs> They're literally faking big brands being on their platform to entice other big brands. This is like when Twitch streamers put up like uh, logos on their screen to pretend that they're being sponsored by like, yeah. fucking G Fuel or something. That way, because <laughs> they're like, look at this stream. Uh, G Fuel's got me. Why isn't McDonald's knocking on the door? Like, that's kind of what they're yeah. doing. They're, they're promoting this <laughs> completely fake persona. That's so fucking funny. Like, sir, you're, you're, we, we found this example of one of your Twitter ads right next to like some blue check uh, Nazi with like 500,000 followers. Like, okay, that's fucked up. But also like, yeah, we haven't advertised on there in a long time. What this the fuck? This is the, uh, the social media uh, ownership equivalent of showing up to like a nightclub with paparazzi that you rented. Yeah. <laughs> hey, well, this guy must be pretty important. Hey, let him right, right this in. this way, sir. <laughs> Oh, uh, anyways, uh, it continues. In a statement provided to CNN, University of Maryland's associate athletic director told the outlet that Maryland football hasn't run a paid ad campaign on X since 2021. We got all the big brands here. We, get, we even got Maryland football. Yeah. You know, Maryland football. Now, Americans Touchdown. love the pigskin. They love the tackles. And they love advertising That's on right. X. So, yeah, that last part, it really is just the cherry on top. If if paying brands weren't also having their ads served next to explicitly Nazi content, it would almost seem like an intentional petty move to just keep running ads from companies that ditch Twitter, but next to highly objectionable That's another content. great take. Yeah. Oh, you want to leave? Well, we're going to keep running your ads, but we're going to put it next to absolute filth. You've become you like the that? exclusive ad partner of Ian Miles Chong. Uh, yeah, that would be clever. Evil, but clever. But no, it seems that Twitter's just, it's just a mess. Yeah. A mess absolutely filled with Nazi content, which naturally raises the chances of literally anything appearing next to said Nazi content, which is often algorithmically pushed onto people's feeds that don't even follow those accounts. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and a lot of that, yeah, a lot of that Nazi content is being monetized. Hope that money's, well, you're giving the Nazis money and you're losing the ad. I don't know. It seems like a bad recipe to me. Yeah. But in other news, here's another Matt Binder scoop about Elon Musk's 153 million followers. That's a lot of followers, but spoiler alert, a lot of them are not real. Who could have seen this coming? The most pressing question for the majority of people is likely whether Musk's followers are fake. Inactive is the better word to use here, as it more aptly describes what the data shows. And a lot of Musk's followers have traits that would lead people to ascertain that they are not actually using the site. 
of the 153,209,283 X accounts following Musk at the time the data was collected, around 42% of Musk's followers, or more than 65.3 million users, have zero followers on their own account. Just over 72%, or nearly 112 million of these users following Musk, have less than 10 followers on their account. When it comes to content creation on the platform, more than 62.5 million Musk followers have zero tweets. This would include users who have deleted all of their tweets by the time this data was collected over the past few weeks, as well as accounts that have never before tweeted. More than 100 million Musk followers have less than 10 tweets posted to their account. And the research also found that while the average average number of followers for all the accounts following Elon Musk is 187. Uh, the more statistically relevant median number of followers was just one. Wow. Most of these people have one follower. Uh, one fourth of Musk's followers have the default blank profile image that you get when you first sign up. More than 40% have four or more numbers in their at handle. <laughs> 44.8 million of Musk followers follow fewer than 10 total users and 13.5 million only follow Elon Musk and no one else. And one last interesting statistic is that out of Musk's 153 million followers, only around 453,000 or 0.3% actually subscribe to X Premium, AKA Twitter Blue. So yeah, I mean, it's impossible to say with certainty, but uh, yeah, a lot, a lot, a ton of Elon Musk's followers are fake. You can 100%. bet your ass that they're <laughs> never going to do one of those follower purges like Instagram and other places have done over the no. years because it would just destroy Elon's followers. And and anyone else that uh, is propping themselves up on these fake followers. So he, I, I, I could guess that he's probably never going to do a followers purge or it's going to be like selectively like only the people that are critical of him. Like, yeah. let's flush the fake followers. Also, it's it's insane to be on Twitter and have zero followers yourself, given the amount of fucking like bots on there. That, yeah, like you can't even get porn bots to follow you. Uh, what a loser! Wow. Yeah. But yeah, and what was it that Elon said was his number one priority for Twitter back when he bought it? What was that again? Mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah, it was getting rid of all the bots. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess he'll be taking care of that any day now. Turns out I actually need the bots. <laughs> I've changed my mind about bots. They're good. I love bots. And we do have more news coming up, like some new disturbing information about that doomed Titan submersible, along with some bad news for AI, which is good news for everybody else. But first, it's time to let you know that this episode is sponsored by Mint Mobile. From the gas pump to the grocery store, your utility bills and favorite streaming services, inflation is everywhere. Make it stop, please. Uh, thankfully, there's one company out there that's giving you a much needed break, and that is Mint Mobile. As the first company to sell premium wireless service online only, Mint Mobile lets you order from home and save a ton, with phone plans starting at just 15 bucks a month. For people looking for extra savings this year, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. By going online only and eliminating the traditional costs of retail, Mint Mobile passes significant savings on to you. All plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash newsday. That is mintmobile.com slash newsday. I used the thing in my phone, worked like a charm. Yeah. Could tell no difference between my current provider and Mint Mobile. So go to mintmobile.com slash newsday. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash newsday. All right, back to the news now. And I know we've already done a lot of reading in this episode. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that Ronan Farrow piece on Elon Musk, writer Susan Casey recently published a very long read in Vanity Fair about Stockton Rush and his Titan submersible that course, imploded back in June on its way down to the wreck of the Titanic. Oh, stop being so negative. Killing still everyone hope. on board. No, nope. Nope, they're, they're gonna they're going to find them any day now. They're, they're goop. Um, so yeah, the story reiterates a lot of what we already knew about this disaster, but the author's knowledge of this very niche field from literally writing a book about it that coincidentally came out this month offers a lot of new insight into how inevitable this all was it, it was absolutely something terrible was going to happen. Everyone knew it. And this offers much more of an inside baseball look at just how much everyone else in this field was like, 
It's only a matter of time. Yeah, send that book back to the printer and add an epilogue that is as long as the entire book. I mean, this article, I think, basically serves as the epilogue of the book. Yeah. And it ends on a rather <laughs> negative note now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, here's a taste of that. In December 2015, two years before the Titan was built, Rush had lowered a one-third scale model of his 4,000 meter sub to be into a pressure chamber and watched it implode at 4,000 PSI, a pressure equivalent to only 2,740 meters. The test's stated goal was to validate that the pressure vessel design is capable of withstanding an external pressure of 6,000 PSI, corresponding to a depth of about 4,200 meters. He might have changed course then, stood back for a moment, and reconsidered, but he didn't. Nevertheless, he persisted. <laughs> uh, instead, OceanGate issued a press release stating that the test had been a resounding success because it demonstrates that the benefits of carbon fiber are real. In what way? How so? Because uh, you were testing for 6,000 PSI and that thing just crumbled into, into shit. At wow, 4, amazing. It, it literally, if I think that it's true and I can say it with confidence, everyone around me will believe what I am saying, despite the clear failure of the demonstration in front of them. Yeah. Um, Literal emperor's new clothes shit. It's founder brain. It's a move fast and break things, uh, but uh, putting people's lives in the balance, which uh, Tesla, of course, <laughs> that's also another example. Uh, of I that, will, but, I uh, will say, the, the one time that the CEO really put his own life on the line uh, and suffered the consequences, you do have to admire it. Uh, you don't, you don't, but at least he went down with the ship. Issuing correction on Ricky's statement, you, uh, do, you do not have to hand it to him. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Uh. So the article then focuses on something that's uh, previously been reported on. We've talked about it a lot. Ocean Gate's director of marine operations, David Lockridge, whose job was making sure the sub was safe, finding out that it absolutely was not safe, and then getting fired for it. Turns out... It was even worse than originally thought, which was pretty bad already. Uh, he was denied the opportunity to even inspect various parts and systems of the sub. And even still, what he was able to look at was so janky that he desperately urged OceanGate to please just go back to the drawing board. And this is a long section, but we're just going to read it all the way through. Lockridge listed more than two dozen items that required immediate attention. These included missing bolts and, oh, Jesus, and improperly secured batteries, components zip-tied to the outside of the sub, O-ring grooves were machined incorrectly, which could allow water ingress. Seals were loose. A highly flammable petroleum-based material lined the Titan's interior. A hosing looped around the sub's exterior, creating an entanglement risk, especially at a site like the wreck of the Titanic, where spars, pipes, and wires protrude everywhere. Yet even those deficiencies paled in comparison to what Lockridge observed on the hull. The carbon fiber filament was visibly coming apart, riddled with air gaps, delaminations, and Swiss cheese holes, and there was no way to fix that short of tossing the hull in a dumpster. The manufacturing process for carbon fiber filament is exacting. Interwoven carbon fibers are wound around a cylinder and bonded with epoxy, then bagged in cellophane and cured in an oven for seven days. The goal is perfect consistency. Any mistakes are baked in permanently. Didn't he buy that stuff at a discount, too? Yeah, yeah. yeah Got this for real cheap. Uh, Looks fine to me. A friend of mine who works at the airport said uh, Boeing wasn't going to miss this. He said, just come after hours and pick no. it up. I'll leave it out by the dumpster. That uh, continues. Given that the hull would be seeing such immense pressures not yet experienced on any known carbon hold vehicle, we run the risk of potential interlaminar fatigue due to pressure cycling, Lockridge wrote, especially if we do have imperfections in the hull itself. The hole would need to be scanned with thermal imaging or ultrasound to reveal the extent of its flaws. Non-destructive inspection is required to be undertaken and subsequent results provided to myself prior to any in-water manned dives commencing, he added, digging in his heels on the scanning. This would reveal any weak spots and provide a baseline that could then be used to check for signs of fatigue after every dive. Scanning the hole shouldn't be a problem, should it? Lockridge noted in another document that OceanGate had previously stated the hole would be scanned. Spoiler alert, the hole was never scanned. Jesus. The Ocean Gate engineering team does not plan to obtain a hole scan and does not believe the same to be readily available or particularly effective. In any event, the company's lawyer, Thomas Gilman, wrote in March 2018, instead, Ocean Gate would rely on acoustic monitoring, sensors on the Titan's hull that would emit an alarm when the carbon fiber filaments were audibly breaking. Just in time. Hey, uh... Sounds like oh they're they're gone now because that's how quickly it happens. What they got they got a heads up. But we up. knew we knew right before it happens. Yeah, 
you know, we, we'd hate for everyone in our sub to die instantly mm -hmm. we, uh, with at least the peace of mind knowing that they didn't suffer. But by adding this new alarm feature, we can ensure that their last moments alive are in pure terror. Mm -hmm. It continues, Lockridge's report was concise and technical, compiled by someone who clearly knew what he was talking about. The kind of document that in most companies would get a person promoted. Russia's response was to fire Lockridge immediately, serve him and his wife with a lawsuit, although Carol Lockridge didn't work at OceanGate or even in the submersible <laughs> industry, for breach of contract, fraud, unjust enrichment, and misappropriation of trade secrets, threaten their immigration status, and seek to have them pay OceanGate's legal fees. Yeah, this Lockridge guy <laughs> uprooted his entire family from Scotland to come work yeah. there. And, uh, yeah. Fuck it, I'm going to see your wife, too. Uh, also, I'm going to sue that bitch wife of yours. Seemingly uh, similar to the same tactics that Musk is using to get there, people to stick around at X. There are a lot of parallels uh, between the two. I don't want, I mean, actually, we've already gone over how Musk is indirectly responsible for uh, countless deaths. But, uh... Yeah, because he hates regulations and he they, hates they, they, the extra work that they make you do to yeah, reach compliance. But yeah, what it, it, Stockton Rush is on a spectrum. He's at the the far end of a spectrum that was was on a far end of a spectrum that includes Elon Musk and probably most Silicon Valley freaks. Mm -hmm. um, they see anyone telling them what to do, telling them what what they're doing is unsafe. They'll do the as, the, the opposite. Yeah. You, I Just guess, to prove a point. I guess you hate innovation. Anyways, Anyways yeah. yeah. So a real highlight of the article concerns a 2016 dive down to the wreck of the Andrea Doria off the coast of Nantucket. Uh, it's not even that deep. It's a couple hundred feet deep. But this is a story that the writer says she heard from multiple people in the deep sea community. It, this story was going around. As chief pilot and the person responsible for operational safety, Lockridge had created a dive plan that included protocols for how to approach the wreck. Any entanglement hazard demands caution and vigilance, touching down at least 50 meters away and surveying the site before coming any closer. Rush disregarded these safety instructions. He landed too close, got tangled in the current, managed to wedge the sub beneath the Andrea Doria's crumbling bow, and descended into a full-blown panic. Hey, watch this. <laughs> <laughs> what can this sub do? <laughs> Whoop! <laughs> No idea what I was trying to do, but uh, almost ended in catastrophe. Pretty cool, huh? Also, this baby's not insured. <laughs> I don't have insurance. Do you love my reckless abandonment? No? In fact, it, it brings you sheer terror? Oh. Hmm. Uh, Lockridge tried to take the helm, but Rush had refused to let him, melting down for over an hour until finally one of the clients shrieked, Give him the fucking controller! <laughs> At which point Rush hurled the controller, a video game joystick, at Lockridge's head. This is... <laughs> the rage quit. The, yeah, the life and death version of not being able to beat a boss. And, and yeah. fine, fine, I'll give it to the guy who says he's better. <laughs> oh, you've beat Elden Ring? Fine, here, do it. <laughs> Lockridge freed the sub in 15 minutes. Oh! <laughs> wow, I guess okay. he knew what he was doing. Uh -huh. The expedition had been planned to include 10 dives, but instead it ended abruptly, with Ocean Gate citing adverse weather conditions. After returning to shore in Boston, Rush held a press conference. We were able to view the Andrea Doria area for nearly four hours, which is more than 10 times longer than scuba divers can, he announced. The dive, Ocean Gate's website noted, had focused on the bow of the vessel. Yeah, this dive was so successful that we actually stayed down there for like several hours longer than anyone planned to, because it was yeah. just going that well. We just were just like, hey, let's let's stick around down here. The coach of that child soccer team was able to stay in a cave and explore longer than any other previous team had, and that is a we should all yeah. be uh, applauding everyone involved. Master caver. What a field trip, the best field trip of all time, I'd say. <sighs> yeah, mm -hmm. would have been better though if there was a child-sized coffin uh, torpedo. Yeah, built by the world's richest and therefore smartest man. I, yeah, Musk tried to build a submarine, and everyone said it was stupid. Luckily, he didn't put an actual child in it. Hey, watch this. <laughs> <laughs> Try that in a small cave. So uh, the author also provides uh, some great context for all this, um, having closely documented several of Ocean Gate's competitors and just seen the amount of money, time, and work that those other companies put into safety testing their subs and getting them formally classified. Uh, the makers of the limiting factors submersible 
Uh, I think that's one of James Cameron's uh, favorites. Uh, it's the gold standard. Um, that judgmental asshole who, you know, it, real opportunist to real make fun of... Uh, armchair quarterback, that James Cameron. <laughs> But uh, yeah, the, the limiting factor, they, the makers of that, they pressure tested every single one of its components at 20,000 PSI, which is equivalent to a depth of 43,000 feet, literally deeper than the Mariana Trench. Seems like Which is how uh, you should yeah. test things. Yeah. Meanwhile, Stockton Rush claims that he didn't need any classification, and he sued David Lockridge for wanting to actually safety test his sub. But he also apparently had the logo of a classification agency up on Ocean Gate's website for a while, which understandably, really pissed off the rest of the deep-sea community. You just looked up the image and just dragged it into yeah. the... Yeah, uh... just put that there. Easy. Who's and gonna check? I guess his explanation was like, well, we're, we're talking to them. We're in communication. They mm -hmm. might do it. I don't know. Yeah. But for now, we're just going to put the logo there so that people know that, uh, well, we might get it safe Look, to test it it's aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, it's a yeah. cool logo. Uh, speaking of which, uh, while writing her book, the author initially tried to actually get a ride on Ocean Gate's submersible, but then she asked her book's other subjects about it. Terry Kirby, the veteran chief pilot of the University of Hawaii's two deep sea subs, the Pisces 4 and the Pisces 5, recoiled when I asked him what he thought about Ocean Gate. Be careful of that, he warned. <laughs> that guy has the whole submersible community really concerned. He's just basically ignoring all the major engineering rules. He paused to make sure that this had sunk in and then added emphatically, do not get into that sub. He is going to have a major accident. Damn, how, Nostradamus over here. <laughs> how could he possibly have known? Does he know? <laughs> <laughs> the article also features another chilling anecdote about how this shit was absolutely doomed to fail and kill a bunch of people. On the Titan's second deep test dive in April 2019, an attempt to reach 4,000 meters in the Bahamas, the sub protested with such blood-curdling cracking and gunshot noises that its descent was halted at 3,760 meters. Rush was the pilot, and he had taken three passengers on this highly risky plunge. One of them was Carl Stanley, a seasoned submersible pilot who would later describe the noises as the whole yelling at you. Stanley was no stranger to risk. He'd built his own experimental unclass sub and operated it in Honduras. But even he was so rattled by the dive that he wrote several emails to Rush urging him to postpone the Titan's commercial debut less than two months away. The carbon fiber was breaking down, Stanley believed. I think that hole has a defect near that flange that will only get worse. The only question in my mind is will it fail catastrophically or not? He advised Rush to step back and conduct 50 unmanned test dives before any other humans got into the sub. True to form, Rush dismissed the advice. One experiential data point is not sufficient to determine the integrity of the whole. Telling Stanley to keep your opinions to yourself. <sighs> yeah, the, uh, it, the article itself is long and it has a lot that we didn't talk about. It's easily one of the best analysis of the whole situation to come out since the incident. So yes, check the links in the description if you want to read more. But let's move over to uh, artificial intelligence news that is sure to give a lot of pause to the motion picture industry at a time when they're clearly betting on AI to replace all those pesky writers waving signs on the sidewalk outside their studios. The copyright implications of AI-generated images and text have remained unsolved during the ongoing hype cycle brought by ChatGPT and DALI, but a federal judge just clarified at least one aspect of it, and it's not good news for anyone hoping to make money off of movies written by an AI. Here's The Hollywood Reporter. More than 100 days into the writer's strike, fears have kept mounting over the possibility of studios deploying generative artificial intelligence to completely pen scripts. But intellectual property law has long said that copyrights are only granted to works created by humans, and that doesn't look like it's changing anytime soon. A federal judge on Friday upheld a finding from the U.S. Copyright Office that a piece of art created by AI is not open to protection. The ruling was delivered in an order turning down Stephen Thaler's bid challenging the government's position, refusing to register works made by AI. Copyright law has never stretched so far to protect works generated by new forms of technology operating absent any guiding human hand, U.S. District Judge Beryl Howell found. The opinion stressed human authorship is a bedrock requirement. And we first talked about this case a few months back, but the law just doubled down on the U.S. Copyright Office's original decision. Uh, this, of course, would not apply to the most likely outcome of Hollywood having AI write their scripts, which is that humans would still be involved, but to a much lesser degree. Humans would still be around to punch up scripts with new drafts, even if the bulk of the scripts were written by AI. 
It's less clear what the implications might be for something like that fake South Park AI that we saw recently, which was pitched as a way to create unlimited user-tailored custom content. So plenty of questions remain, and there's also the biggest unanswered question. If you feed a bunch of human-written scripts into an AI to train it how to write scripts, are those human writers being plagiarized? I guess we'll see eventually. Uh, or maybe soon, because apparently <laughs> the New York Times is strongly considering suing OpenAI. Here's NPR. For weeks, the Times and the maker of ChatGPT have been locked in tense negotiations over reaching a licensing deal in which OpenAI would pay the Times for incorporating its stories in the tech company's AI tools. But the discussions have become so contentious that the paper is now considering legal action. The individuals who confirmed the potential lawsuit requested anonymity because they were not authorized to speak publicly about the matter. A lawsuit from the Times against OpenAI would set up what could be the most high-profile legal tussle yet over copyright protection in the age of generative AI. A top concern for the Times is that ChatGPT is, in a sense, becoming a direct competitor with the paper by creating text that answers questions based on the original reporting and writing of the paper's staff. It's a fear heightened by tech companies using generative AI tools in search engines. Microsoft, which has invested billions into OpenAI, is now powering its Bing search engine with ChatGPT. If, when someone searches online, they are served a paragraph-long answer from an AI tool that refashions reporting from the Times, the need to visit the publisher's website is greatly diminished, said one person involved in the talks. And yeah, that's a... Uh, uh, I mean... You can get into the abstract, like, oh, this is wrong creatively, but like this argument is like, you are literally taking money out of my pocket, taking food out of my baby's mouth. And it's it's gonna get worse too, because not to go straight back to the Elon stuff, but one of his latest pitches is just removing headlines yeah, yeah, from yeah. Twitter and just showing thumbnails. That's gonna be great for the spread of um, information. Yes, and also just a very annoying uh, way to view any timeline. Yeah, uh, personally, I like knowing what I'm clicking on. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I, you know, it's better than just links and a picture. That could be anything. <laughs> um, that's just me, though. Now, this is all totally hypothetical at this point, but according to the article, if the lawsuit happens and OpenAI is found to have violated the New York Times copyright, the legal penalty would not only be fines, but also the complete destruction of OpenAI's data set, forcing them to build the entire thing over from scratch. So we've potentially got that to look forward to. Woo! Yeah. But in other AI news, the cruise robo-taxis up in San Francisco keep getting themselves into wacky situations. And wacky racers. Yep. Like shutting down and blocking traffic outside a major music festival because too many people were using their cell phones at once. They've also, in just the past week, crashed into a construction site and gotten stuck in cement. Wacky. So silly. Uh, they've also crashed into a fire truck, which uh, seems to be the thing that uh, self-driving cars love to do yeah, more than anything the else. The car just went right through an intersection when clearly a fire truck was coming down the street. Because if you're a human, you hear that and you see that and you're like, oh, I'm going to stop. Uh, the car, like, well, the light's green. <laughs> yep. Watch this. <laughs> the light's green and white and red, and I <laughs> love it. Uh, yeah, so uh, hilariously, this is all right after getting the green light from the state of California to expand the robo-taxi fleet to double its previous size. The city of San Francisco, in response, begged the state to halt the robo-taxi <laughs> expansion, and the state thankfully has agreed. Here's TechCrunch. Cruise, the self-driving car subsidiary of GM, has been asked to reduce its robo-taxi fleet by 50% in San Francisco following a crash Thursday night with a fire truck. The California Department of Motor Vehicles, the agency that regulates the testing and deployment of autonomous vehicles in the state, requested the reduction in operations. The state agency said it is investigating recent concerning incidents involving cruise vehicles in San Francisco. Concerning. It called for crews to reduce its fleet by 50% and have no more than 50 driverless vehicles in operation during the day and 150 driverless vehicles in operation at night until the investigation is complete. Still seems like too many. They should, this is where testing comes in because they should just get like hundreds of cop cars, fire trucks, and ambulances in a big parking lot somewhere and just be like, all right, navigate around all of these. Yeah, I mean, it seems. Instead, that'll cause way too much work for, uh, to go back to the drawing board and be like, oh, geez. Again, the stress testing, like, seems like if you want autonomous cars, you are going to have to put them in every possible situation. Yeah. And the fact that it doesn't know when a emergency vehicle is coming and what to do about that is concerning, for sure. It, not only is it crashing into them, it is shutting down and blocking streets yeah. in the most inopportune moments 
therefore blocking the emergency. So when they're not able to get where they're going, they have the risk of getting run into yeah, and time. also, you know, like a human gets in a car accident, you know, assuming it's not catastrophic, you, you, you stop, you get all the information you need, then you get the fuck out of the way. Yeah. Um, I don't know what happens when one of these cars gets in an accident. They got to call up someone downtown to get on a scooter and come, uh, come grab the car. Yeah. This is so infuriating. Like, uh, San Francisco is such a fucking dystopian hellscape <laughs> in many ways, but like, it's so fucking infuriating historically speaking, that they're doing this there when, like many cities, San Francisco had... They had a robust uh, cable car system. That they, they have a subway been, in the city, too. Like well, it's, it's, it's not perfect, yeah, but... Bart, Bart is pretty limited. And, and there, there is a lot of, like, geographical reasons why yeah. San Francisco can't have, like, a perfect public transit system, but mm -hmm. it's still, it's just, like, you can ride a fucking cable car that's over 100 years old. Perfectly and fine. And it's, like, you know... Even if we were just taking this to get from one end of the city to the other, it would still be far more pleasant than whatever the hell we replace that shit with. I can also think of a million other cities that uh, would be more... Uh, if I was forced into the scenario, which thankfully I haven't uh, ridden in an AI-driven car or whatever yet, but the, less stressful than the streets of San Francisco, Wait, Uber... which not only have the the standard city problems of like traffic, pedestrians, yeah. and everything else, but also the steepest hills. Yeah, it's uh, it's a... Uh, it's, uh, it's a boss level. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, Uber was testing their shit in like Chandler, Arizona, which I'm and they sure, still hit people. Yeah, it's like a grit. They killed someone. Yeah, like immediately within months of starting it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. Also, do we need this? It's like one of those ideas when I first heard it like ten years ago. I'm like, yeah, pretty cool. But then the more I learn about it, I'm like, I mean, I guess we don't need this. Yeah. Why? It, why? It, it's strange. What are we doing it. it, it <laughs> Even, even successful, even if it was wide, like widely adopted and very successful, you're still creating congestion. Yeah. It, it doesn't make any sense. Like, it's just a bunch of people riding around in their own little pods. Public transit has been around for yeah over a hundred years. I mean, I'm now uh, I now live close enough to a LA uh, metro station, but. The the route the routes are so limited that I, I've only ever used it for like very specific trips. When I have them, like this is fucking awesome. Yeah, it works like, great. Especially like I've taken it to go down to Long Beach, which mm -hmm. is it's a long ride. It's like a ninety minute ride versus like a car ride that would be like about an hour. So yeah. it's a little longer, but just being able to like relax and like fucking listen to a oh, book yeah. on my phone and it's, I it's would, the best. Uh, nine times out of ten, take the Surfliner to San Diego than actually drive. Oh, you know, yeah. Once just I relaxing. Once I discovered the Surfliner, I'm like, I'm never driving to San Diego ever again. Yeah. That drive is so stressful and annoying. I, I and I love New York, but it is so aggravating going to New York City and then coming back to Los Angeles. Yeah. Or, or if you went to any other city where you're just like, I just spent the last. Four days going wherever the fuck I wanted on public transit like that. Yeah. And now I, I have to get to the airport, get in my car, and drive like 90 minutes in traffic. But what if that car could drive itself? <laughs> wow. We've solved the problem, yeah. everyone. Congratulations. Anyway, that's our show. Uh, obviously, there's a lot we... Uh, we got Trump. We got a lot to talk about in tomorrow's we episode. We got mug shots. We got the debate. We got uh, the Russian... Uh, the, the Putin's personal chef had a little oopsie on an airplane. R.I.P. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, the debates. Uh, I, I haven't even caught up with that, but I'm very excited. Uh, the, a lot of yelling. Lots of uh, all the Vivek candidates. Vivek V. Ron. Dawn of loser. It, it was very much a crowd versus the candidates versus each other. Versus the uh, moderators uh, in over their heads. Realizing Whoever wins, we all lose. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, yes, we'll be back with more. In the meantime, we have two new episodes for you right over here. Please like the video. Click the like button right now. Come do on. it. I know you forgot to do it. You, you're like, oh, I, I do this every time. Nope, but this time I forgot. It it. No, nope, you got to do it. You Click it. Do it. Uh, leave a comment. Reply to a comment. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. And we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.